Okay, hello everyone. Evening. Welcome to tonight's class. We're going to be learning about the laws of supervised and unsupervised milk. I don't like calling it kosher milk and non-kosher milk. I'd rather call it su supervised milk and non-supervised milk. Um, known as Chalav Yisrael and Chalav Akum. Chalav Yisrael is um, fully supervised milk with a heksha on it. And uh, Chalav Akum is non-supervised milk, milk milk by a, by a non-Jew and bottled by a non-Jew and all the rest of it. Okay, I, I just also want to mention that when it comes to cheese, cheese is very different. Cheese, one must, must buy kosher cheese, cheese with a heksha on it, cheese that has been supervised all the way. Milk is different. A lot of people make the mistake of... of, of um, of putting milk and cheese in the same mode in terms of kashras, it's not. With milk, with, with cheese, we're a lot more strict. With milk, there is room to be lenient. The other thing that I want to say is that whatever you do, right, whether you whether you only have supervised milk or whether you don't have super whether you don't have supervised milk, whatever you do is got is is absolutely kosher, so to speak. Whatever you do has got backing. Whatever you do is um, with, with regard to milk. You got big rabbis supporting you. The purpose of tonight is just to explain, is to help explain all of the issues. Okay, so and any questions, feel free to ask. This shouldn't be a lecture; it should be interactive. So let's get started. <coughs> the Mishnah in Avodah says that it is forbidden to have milk which was not uh, the milk of a non-Jewish person. The milk of a non-Jewish farmer. Why are there two reasons given? The Bavli says, the Babylonian Talmud says, we're concerned that the non-Jewish farmer will mix in some milk of a pig or some milk of a, of a non-kosher animal. The Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, has a different reason. He says, no, we're concerned that the milk would have been uncovered and maybe a snake would have gone inside it, right? So there's two reasons why we've got to make sure that we buy Chalav Yisrael. We've got to make sure that we have... Um, uh, supervised, fully supervised milk. That was back in the times of the Gemara. But basically, there's a big argument between the rabbis. Basically, and, and it comes down to this. So back in the time of the Talmud, they made this gazera, they made this decree about kosher milk, about supervised milk. The question is, is does this decree still apply nowadays when the reason doesn't apply meaning so nowadays you can we can know that the milk is kosher right we can ascertain the milk is kosher we don't we're not concerned that they're putting pig's milk in there we're not concerned right if one is not concerned that there's not going to be a snake going in there or one's not concerned there's going to be chafe milk in there right if the if the concern is no longer there does the decree still apply right so some say once there's been a decree, it's been a decree. It doesn't matter if the reason is no longer applicable. The decree is decreed, therefore you always have to keep it. And therefore, you've always, therefore you always have to buy supervised milk. Some will say that. Others will say, no, now that we don't have the concern, it's possible to buy milk which isn't supervised. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. That's what the Machloquist is about. The Machloquist comes down to, you got the, you got the decree, you got the gazera, you got the reason. If the reason doesn't exist anymore, is no longer applicable, does the decree still apply, yes or no? That's what this, everything comes down to. And that's why you got very reputable rabbis say that, yes, the decree is still there, even though the reason might not be there, even though the concern might not be there. And other very reputable rabbis will say, no. That um, so, so other, some rabbis will say whether the whether concern is there or not, the decree is still there. And others will say, if the reason's not there, if the concern's not there, then we, you no longer have to have supervised milk. And therefore, you can have unsupervised milk. That's ultimately what the whole argument or what the whole discussion comes down to. Any questions? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, or, I don't know if that's good or bad, I don't know. But uh, okay, so what we're going to do, first we're going to, by the way, the purpose of this isn't to say, right, the purpose of this isn't for me to encourage you all to have supervised milk, and it's not to encourage you all to have unsupervised milk, right? It's just to explain everything and to, and to, and to explain how the land lies regarding this issue. Okay, fine. So, um, 
First, we're going to discuss the rabbis who say, who, who are strict on the matter, who say, no, the a decree is a decree. The decree was made in the time of the Mishnah, the in the time of the Talmud, and the decree still exists these days. Okay, so um, Rashi and uh, the Beit Yosef quotes a number of, of rabbis as well, who all say that the the decree still applies, even if there's no concern, even if there's no non-kosher animals in the farmer's flock, even if there's no non-kosher animals in the whole area, a gazera is a gazera, a decree is a decree. The Chassam Sofer explains something very interesting. He says the, the Jews at the time of the Talmud, they took on this decree. And because they accepted this decree, it became like a like a biblical decree. Some, we say a similar thing by Mariv. So Mariv originally was optional, but the Jews accepted it. They took it on. So it became as if it's now an obligation, right? So, so too, when it came, when it comes to milk, the Chosun Zeva says, because all the Jews back in the times of the Talmud, they did this, it's as if they made it into a, a, a into a biblical decree. And therefore, who are we to say that, um, you know, that we shouldn't do this anymore? He said that the Ashkenazim, where he lived, um, his time had a custom to be strict. Um, Mikhail Kashyakov was a post in the 20th century. He said something interesting. He said that we should be strict when it comes to Chal of Israel. Why? Because otherwise this practice will be forgotten from Klai Israel. A lot of the time, sometimes, you know, the rabbis are strict because they want to make sure that the, the practices aren't forgotten from, from the Klai Israel. They aren't forgotten from, from the people. And this is an example of that, the uh, the Arch Shulchan says something interesting. He says that the the the, the words of Chazal, the words of our saviors, are like hot coals. Yeah, so, so the, who are we to you know to you know we we, we, we got to make sure we the, they're like hot coals. We can't possibly do anything with them. You know they uh we we can't touch their words. They're, they're too hot, right? We can't possibly play around with them. We got to listen to this decree of the Mishnah. And he also says something interesting. He says yes. But the original reason given was the reasons I said because of the snake and because of concern that there'd be non-kosher milk in there. But he also says that another reason why the rabbis introduced this decree was concern for assimilation, you know, similarly to why we only allowed to have kosher wine, right? Similarly with the whole bread argument we had last week. He says that's also a reason, and therefore we uh, we should be strict about this. Um, what's interesting is even though there are major Sephardi rabbis in the Middle Ages who were lenient, Ravad Yosef, who's probably the most significant contemporary Sephardic rabbinic figure, he was strict on this. And Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, who was a previous chief rabbi of, um, of Israel, says, he says something interesting. So in Israel, the Rabbanut have two Heshers, right? They have the regular Rabbanut and they have Rabbanut Mahadrin, right? So um, so they have kosher and like super kosher, right? Regular kosher and like glut kosher. In the Rabbanut, they have two standards of kashas, right? Most, restu most restaurants, most <coughs> um, most restaurants, most hotels will be regular Rabbanut because it's easier, it's that they're more lenient, it's less, it's cheaper for establishments to have this heksha. But other places will have a mahadrin standard. There'll be, you know, there'll be a higher standard, it'll cost a bit more money. The the, there'll, be, there'll be more supervisors, there'll be more showroom, there'll be more mashkiachs, they'll have higher standards with certain things. Um, so, yeah, so the procedures when it comes to having a mahadran heksha compared to a regular heksha, the procedures for a mahadran heksha will be strict, will be more strict. However, says the Mordechai Eliyahu, when it comes to milk, even the regular heksha, he said in Israel, even the regular heksha, he ruled, you had to have Khalif Yisrael in Israel. He was like Rabban Yosef, who held, who was very strict. When it comes to milk, you got to have Kol Yisrael. You've got to have milk, which was, uh, which was, which was supervised. Um, we'll come again later in the. We'll come back later in, in this session for, in terms of, in terms of that whole difference between regular Rabbanut and and Mahadrin. It should be noticed. But by the way, in Jerusalem. There's uh, there's lots of Mahadran places. If you go to somewhere, you know, up in the north, right? Then the, it's it can be quite it can be quite hard sometimes to to find a Mahadran restaurant. Whereas somewhere with a more religious population, because there's more of a need for it, they'll they'll, they'll have more Mahadran restaurants. 
such as um, such as Yerushalayim. Okay, so now, so we know why to be strict. We've heard various different reasons. Gezerah is a gezerah. Um, the interesting approach to the Chassam Sofa were about how when the Jewish people accepted this practice, it became like a Doraisa, it became like a biblical decree, other, other reasons as well. So why should we be, so how could one be lenient? So the Tashbets, 15th century uh, famous rabbinic figure, he says that if you have reasons that if the if the concern no longer applies, then it should be kosher. The example he gives, um, which uh, I, I, I quoted a bit before in the Beit Yosef, he says, if there's only kosher animals on the farm or, or in his flock or in the entire area, and there's no reason to suspect he's put, therefore, you know, pig's milk or non-kosher milk into the in, into the into the into the milk, right? Therefore. There's no concern, and therefore one should be able to have that milk from that non-Jewish person. He also says, interestingly, that if there's a ca camel nearby, camel's milk is more expensive, right? Camel's milk, from what I understand, is like three or four times the price, and farmers, non-Jewish farmers, wouldn't want to put camel's milk and mix it in with the regular milk because they could sell that for a lot more money. So he says it's perhaps also, if it's just kosher animals and camels, then maybe it should be kosher as well because there's an incentive for the non-Jewish farmer not to put the camel's milk inside the regular milk. The Radvaz and the pre Khadash, both Safadi rabbis, um, both agreed that with the Tashbet, if there's no, if there's no concern, then the, then the milk is kosher. The pre Khadash also explains, he says that the Jews of Amsterdam and other, and also some other Sephardic communities as well, um, they actually have kind of akum, right? So we have communities who already do it, although the Mashad, um, you know, was, uh, was disputes this. He says, no, in Amsterdam, they only allow it for the, for the, for the sick and for children. So therefore, you can't. He claim he says you can't use that as a precedent, because they don't, they don't allow it for everyone. It's only for certain circumstances. They're lenient in certain at certain times and for and for certain people. So those are the the medieval commentators. What about the more modern ones? So the most famous rabbi who talks about this is Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein was the or was definitely the most authoritative. Ashkenazi rabbi outside of Israel in the post second world in the post World War II period. He lived he originally from Europe, then he lived on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, and he wrote the, the most famous rabbinic piece about this subject comes from him. He wrote it in 1954, and you know in, in, until this point, pretty much most Jews kept Chal of Israel. I mean, not everyone, but most did, but but really. Rav Moshe Feinstein's teshuva, his piece in 1954, was a massive game changer. And he said this. He said that in halacha, if you know something or you're pretty sure of something, it's as if it's, it's as if you've seen it. So the Gemara in Shavuos gives an example. Right? So you got a camel that was kicking, that was kicking another camel. And then all of a sudden, you know, you turn, you know, you, you see later that there's a camel dead. You pretty much be sure that the camel that was kicking was the one that killed it. Or he says that um, when it comes to a man, a man and a wife, right? They have their chuppah, they go into the yichud room, and then they, you know, after the wedding, they go, um, you know, they, uh, you know, they sleep wherever they sleep that night. Yes, people didn't see the marriage being consummated, right? But we're pretty sure that at some point the marriage was consummated. So even though we don't know these things happen, right, the camel and the, and the woman, right, being married to be consummated, we don't know they happen. We're, you know, it, it's, we're pretty sure that they did, right? We're, we're, we're very, very certain that they did. And it's as if you saw these things happen. And so he says that in countries like America, you know, or such like England as well, right? In these countries, it is the law for milk to be cow's milk, right? In America, in England, in England, if Sainsbury's, if ShopRite, if Walmart, if whatever, I don't know, <coughs> Waitrose, they sell milk, it has to be cow's milk. It has to be legally there. If they don't put cow's milk in there, they're doing something wrong. And more so than that, if they are caught 
by government inspectors putting non-kosher milk in there, putting pig's milk in there. They're fine. They get into trouble. They get, they get taken to court, right? And so, therefore, the, the companies are scared because the government inspectors, they come in, right? And so, because of that, we as a Jewish community are very, very sure that there is cow's milk going into these bottles. And therefore, because we are very sure, because the, um, the milk companies are scared of the government, right? It's as if, it's, it's as if we, we, it's as if we know, it's as if we've seen the milk go into the, go into, go into the bottles. So, and so for this reason, you know, because he says the rule and the, the, because of this, what he says, because of his reasoning, he says that nowadays, again, in countries like England, like in America, one can one can have milk. Because again, if you're in a place where, if you're in a country where they don't have these rules, like Spain, like Portugal, you know, where it's not illegal for farmers to put all sorts of stuff in the milk, right? You can't. But in countries, in certain Western countries, where it's illegal for them not to put in cow's milk, for that reason, um, he says that people can drink milk, drink karavakum, drink unsupervised milk. He says that lots of people do it and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Again, it's because, yes, there's no Jew there, but because the we, we can pretty much ascertain that it is kosher, but even though we don't see it, because we're pretty sure it's there, it's as if we've seen it. And he compares it to the case of a camel and um, and the case of uh, and the cases of an Asia's ish. A case of a, you know, of a, of a the consummation of a marriage. However, it's important to notice that he himself didn't have uh, kind of he himself didn't have unsupervised milk, and also it's important to say that he encouraged people to be strict, right? He encouraged people, you know, who have aspirations spiritually to be strict. Yeah, he says this is. However, he says the practice to have unsupervised milk is perfectly okay. But also, I should say that he also encouraged schools, Jewish schools, to have chal of Yisrael, to have supervised milk. Why? As an important chinuch lesson for the children, to show the importance of going above and beyond. It's important to teach children to go above and beyond when it comes to Torah mitzvahs. This is an example of that. And by schools doing that, it teaches that, that lesson. Um, the Chazanish, very famous rabbi in... Uh, Post Second World in post in, in, just after the establishment of the state of Israel, lived in, lived in Israel. He was he relied on this during wartime when it was hard to, to get milk, and he relied on this for, for, for sick people. What's interesting actually is Ramosh Fadzi discusses something else. Someone asked him, Well, when it comes to the government supervising milk. <laughs> when it comes to the government, like doing the job of the showmas, doing the job of um, of supervisors, maybe they can be bribed, right? You know, people take bribes, so maybe they can take bribes, and maybe maybe therefore the milk isn't kosher. Maybe the milk isn't. Maybe the milk is is pig's milk because they can take bribes. And so Ramosha says that in order for that to happen, he says yes, that can happen. But in order for that to happen, so many people would have to be bribed. The people in the factory, the government officials, the inspectors, there'd be so many people who'd have to be on the game. It would cost the milk company so much money, right? And, it, and, and it's, so realistically, it's, it's, it wouldn't happen because, not, not that it can't happen, but it's realistically, it's, it, it's not likely for that reason because so many people would have to be on it. It's not as if you'd have to just bribe one person. You have to buy, bribe many people. And therefore, he, Ramosha isn't concerned about that. Um, it's important to realize that, uh, so Ramosha Feinstein, he says it was okay, but he didn't drink it himself. Rav Soloveitchik, he thought it was okay. And Rav Soloveitchik himself used to drink Konovakum. He used to go to, uh, have, I used to drink unsupervised milk. He, he had three reasons for that. So first of all, reason the first two reasons we've said, because, um, you know, because, because of the government and also because in areas where the, the farms only have kosher cow, uh, they only have cows. These farms nowadays, they only have cows. They don't tend to have other animals there. So that's for one reason, meaning because there was no other animals in the air. Then the government was the second reason. Uh, the third reason, which no one else mentions, is because the original, 
decree of the Talmud, of the Mishnah, was with regarding cows, which was milked by hand, was these days it's all done by machine. So he thinks that's another reason to be lenient. So he has those three reasons together to be lenient on, to rely on. And he had, and he himself used to used to drink halavakum, used to drink unsupervised milk. Um, something else which is important to to remember to remember. Actually, I'll, I'll stop there for a second before I mention a couple other things. I, I've said a lot of things. I've mentioned a lot of different rabbis. I've said lots of different opinions. I've said um, lots of different. I've shared lots of different logics for this for for, for you know on, on both sides. Has anyone got any questions? Anyone not sure of anything? Anyone wants something to be clarified? Yes, yeah, Sharna, you got, I see your hand. Two questions. Okay. Yes. So the first is, what? How does yogurts come into it? Like cheese is definitely a no go. Would yogurts be? Okay. 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 Yogurts is. <sighs> yeah, you, 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 Okay, do the other question first. The other question is, for example, unfortunately for me, the chocoholic here. So celebrations, for example, I've got the KLBD hush on Correct. it. But for example, um, I'm trying to think roses, for example, haven't. So how would the milk in the celebrations, does that mean it? it's... That's okay. Like, it, what's the difference between if it's Cadbury's? One is roses and one is celebrations. One's kosher, one's KLBD, one's it's not. Shana, give, give me give me a second. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. So give me a second. That's okay. So we have one well, other question as yeah, well. One second, one second, give, 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 give me a second, give me a second. Sure. Yeah, so in, yeah, in, in terms of, sorry. Yeah, so in terms of a yogurt, mm. yeah, in terms of a yogurt, they are, they are, it, 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 it comes down to this. It comes down to this. Um, but, but, but with the yogurt, but they still need to be, uh, it it, 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 it it comes down it's to the, the same, same argument, and that's why and that's why some rabbis and some hechsherim will 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 um will authorize it, and others and others will not. Um, in terms of the in terms of the 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 um the roses and the what the other what well, the other one the was celebrations are kosher, yeah. the roses aren't. Yeah, so they make Cadbury's. Right, so that means that. Yeah, the, the London based in will authorize things which are chalavakum. Okay, so Cadbury celebrations is kosher for those who rely on chalavakum. For those who rely on chalav Yisrael, it wouldn't be acceptable. Ah, right? right. Now, when it comes to roses, roses are not acceptable for anyone because anyone, of the yeah. ingredients which go inside. I mean, in order for kosher, in order for the milk to be kosher, sorry, in order for the chocolates to be kosher, the milk. If, if you hold by Chalav Yisrael, so the milk would have to be Chalav Yisrael, and so the ingredients would have to be kosher, right? But even according to those who are late lenient and hold by Chalav Akum, the ingredients would still, have, would still have to be kosher. And so therefore, with the celebrations, there's Chalav Akum, but there's also, uh, and the ingredients are kosher. With roses, it's Chalav Akum, but the ingredients are not kosher, and that's why they are not supervised. The other thing that I would say, yeah, yeah, that's where I'm, that's what I would say. Yeah. So the other thing I would say is that the the, the normally on the hersha it will say whether it's chalav Yisrael or not. 
Right. If you go on the London based it's on the on the website, either on the packet it'll say, or if it's not on the packet, it'll say it. If there's not hexha on the packet, if there's hexha on the packet, it'll say either chal v'israel or chal v'akum. And if it's not on the packet, then that normally means it's chal v'akum. But it but it'll say that on the on the on on this case on the London based it app. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask one more quick question? Sure, sure, always. Is that okay? Always, always, always. What about vegetarian cheese? Vegetarian cheese. What 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 do you mean by vegetarian cheese? Well, there is. You can buy. Um, you, I've seen vegetarian cheese. I don't know what it's made of. If it's cheese, if it's, it's cheese, right? You can't you, you can't eat it. Cheese. Has to be bought with a hersha. Cheese you okay. cannot buy from Tesco. Cheese you cannot buy from Waitrose. You cannot buy from Sainsbury's. Cheese has to, even though it's only made from milk or whatever. Yeah. The the, 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 all the rabbinic authorities, everyone says when it comes to cheese, the decree cheese is, is really made strict. And the decree is still there. And even when it says vegan oh, cheese, it's correct, strict. correct, correct. Uh, oh, vegan, no... vegan cheese, vegan cheese wouldn't be made with milk. No, no. Saying, there's a difference between vegan cheese and vegetarian cheese. If yeah, vegetarian cheese is a no. Vegan, if it's vegan cheese, I mean, people. I mean, it's still advisable to you know to buy stuff with extra because even because what I'll say because when it comes to things which are vegan in this country, if things are below a certain level, you don't have to put them on the ingredients, right? Right. So it's still, it's it's still. Uh, so there might be other stuff in there. So it's still, you know, best. Still not. To, to, to okay. Work. Thank you so much. Yeah. No. <laughs> Honestly, questions. I love questions. Yes. I would also, also along those lines, when you were saying vegetarian but vegan, vegan cheese, I mean, you've explained that, that really you need to check for a hex of it. You've got a lot on the KLBD list that talks about dairy-free. There are a lot of dairy-free cheeses, a lot of them that are on the list but not necessarily got a hex share. Right, okay, okay. Anything, like, anything, like, that, okay, anything that's on the list, okay, okay, okay. I have to clarify something as well. In America, if something's kosher, it's got a stamp on it. No problem. Because in America, people associate kosher with... Um, people associate kosher with quality, right? But in, in Europe, but for some people, non-Jewish people think of kosher, they think, oh my gosh, some rabbis touch my food, game away, I, I don't want that, right? So therefore, a lot of things in this country will be kosher, but they won't put the hexer on it. So therefore... The, if it's on the London Basin app as kosher, it's kosher. You've got nothing to worry about. Yeah, so you um, can't always go by walking around the shop looking at the battery packet. You've got to research it as well. So there might yeah, be it, it, there's, a, there's a great app on your phone you can get. There's a great app you yeah. can get. That's what I was Is thinking. it kosher? Is it kosher for that one? Um, here, one second. Yeah, I think I've got it on my phone. I don't even know what it's called. Here, one second. Yeah, I, uh, yeah KLBD London is called here, like this. Yeah, that one. Oh, hang on. I've got is it kosher? Yeah, same one, same one, same yeah. one. Is it kosher? Yeah. Yeah, it's the kosher, one I yeah. use. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's the best one to use. Um, okay, fine. No, I'm, I'm pleased we, I'm pleased we clarified those things. Um, that was great. Okay, very good. Now, I want, I want to a couple of other things. So, Rav Yahav Kamenetsky says that oh, look, obviously. If someone's not kosher, you can't eat off their plates, right? Even if they have kosher food, right? So if my next door neighbor who's not Jewish, you know, invites me around for, um, I don't know, glut kosher, whatever it is, right? I still can't eat off his knives and forks and plates because it's not kosher. However, Avel Kabnetsky says that if you are strict by Chal of Yisrael and your neighbor has Chal of Akum and he invites you for Shabbos lunch or whatever it is, right? You can eat off his plates, you can eat off his knives, no problem, even though he only has a... Even though, even though someone else might keep, might not keep halvis Israel, you can still eat off their stuff, no problem. Um, question was asked to to Ravel Yasher, the big rabbi in Israel. Well, when it comes to supervising milk factories, can you do it by cameras? Right, do you actually have to be there? Can you be there by cameras? He, I thought, interesting question. He thought, um, he thought that would be acceptable. Um, in terms of practices of the major halachic authorities, or in terms of the, the, um, the, the hachshirim, how do they? What do they do? So, in America, the OU, which is the main cash authority, they hold by Moshe Feinstein and they certify things which are halabakum. 
<coughs> there. However, in terms of the other ones, other ones, do, some do, some don't. There, there is a range, but in America, it's it's accepted to, you know, in the in the mainstream Orthodox community, it's accepted for people to have to have Chalabakum. But again, some people are strict. Rav Moshe did encourage that, and some people some people are strict about it too. However, in Israel, um, Rav, Rav Bakshi Daron, who was Fadi chief rabbi of Israel, he died actually of COVID last year. But um, but he's quite, but but he wrote about this and he said no in Israel we're strict by Chal of Yisrael when it comes to the when it comes to the Kashrut authorities why are they strict there for three main reasons first of all in Israel there's like less of a need right you got you got the Jewish farmers all over the place also they want to they feel like they have an obligation to support the local kosher farmers and not get from else and, and not go from elsewhere um, and also he says that nowadays the he says that the the production of milk is more complicated and it's harder to to, to soup it it's we're less sure because it's more complicated we're less sure when it comes to khalid vacuum that in fact it is kosher and therefore so for those three reasons together they're strict when it comes in the rabbanut when it comes to khalid as well they're strict as i said before both for the regular heksha and also you know for, for not just for the strict heksha not just for the bahadran heksha but also for the regular one also for the standard rabbanut one too. Um, there's an interesting question, fascinating discussion, when it comes to powdered milk. When it comes to powdered milk, should there be a difference? You know, meaning if you hold by Chal of Yisrael, you, then you should have be hold. You should be strict when it comes to powdered milk. If you hold by Chal of Akko, you could be needed when it comes to powdered milk. Surely, not. but really. Some say there is a difference. Some say that you, there's room to be lenient by powdered milk, even if you're stripped by Chal of Yisrael. By, by Chal of Yisrael. How so? Um, for the following reason. So when it comes to butter, um, the Rambam quotes two opinions. When it comes to butter, you can only make butter out of milk from a kosher animal. Therefore, when it comes to butter, there's no concern that butter... The milk is made from from non-kosher milk. There's no concern, right? And therefore, for that reason, for that reason, um, you know, some rule writes the Rambam that butter's kosher even if it's produced by a non-Jew. However, others say no, it's from milk, and because milk you have to have. Some people are strict on because milk you you know really there's this gazera once once don't have a So too with butter, the gazera applies as well, right? So when it comes to butter. Some rule, as I, for reasons I just explained, some rule that butter, there's a, you're, you're, we're lenient for, but others say no, butter, we're strict, just like when it comes to milk. And based off this, from Svi Pesach Frank, who was, again, a big rabbi in the 20th century, he says that you can compare powdered milk to butter. How so? Because you take the milk, and just like you made a different format of the milk to make butter, and therefore the halacha is different. So too, once you take milk and you make it into another different form, i.e. powdered milk, then also the same thing should apply. There should be a difference, right? And so therefore, as Free Pesa Frank says, for those who say that butter from a non-Jew is acceptable, then also powdered milk from a non-Jew, right, should be acceptable. But for those who say that you have to have butter from a Jewish person, therefore, that for those people, you also have to have powdered milk from a Jewish person too. And for this reason, Rav Bakshi Daron says that when it comes to the to the Mahajan Heksha in, 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 in Israel, people want to use powdered milk. For the Mahajan Heksha, you have to have powdered milk, which is Chal of Yisrael. But they're lenient when it comes to the Mahajan Heksha. For the Mahajan Heksha, for this reason, based off, you know, from page three, page of Frank, <laughs> they are lenient for the regular hersha, um, again, just with powdered milk, not with not with regular milk, but when it comes to powdered milk. Okay, any questions on that? Any questions or anything else? Am I, am I clear? There's something that's not, uh, you know, that. Uh... No. Okay. Um, fine. I just want to conclude by saying that I, I said at the beginning. There are perfectly legitimate and lucky reasons why one should be strict. There are perfectly legitimate and lucky reasons why someone can be lenient. You've got big rabbis on this side. You've got big rabbis on this side. And whatever you do is, is good. Um, again, Ramosha Feinstein, who people, who people rely on, 
did encourage, even though he allowed it, he said you should be strict. But on the other hand, Rosolovic drank it himself. You know, you know, you know, drank Chalavachal himself. So really, whatever you do, that is what to rely on. And one shouldn't think that because someone does something different to them, that they are doing something um, which isn't right. So people who 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 keep Chalavachal shouldn't think that people who are only have Chalav Israel are fanatics. And also, similarly, people who, who only have Chalav Israel shouldn't think anything less of people who who, who don't remember. Yochan Netsky said, you know, it makes no difference in terms of eating, in terms of plates and cutlery and crockery. And um, so that's important. So anyway, hopefully everyone's uh, found this session interesting. Hopefully every, everyone has learned something. I enjoyed <laughs> doing all the research. And um, thank you for joining. Just before we uh, just t- take any questions at the end, just want to remind everyone that next week is the final show in the series from Diane Simons. The information will be in the newsletter and the information will be actually, I'll tell you exactly when it is. So I've got the information over here. One second. The show next week with Diane Simons. Yes, on Thursday. Yes, it's on Thursday at eight o'clock. Thursday, eight o'clock, because yeah, there's lots of shows taking part in this program. So um, we're all coming together for the show with Dan Simons next week at eight o'clock. So thank you. And uh, yeah, any, you any more much. questions? Any, any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Can I, um, can I ask you something? Yes, of course. So I so saw on facebook there's a uh, it's like a street caterer kosher caterer klbd yeah providing round for the shoes um quite a lot of the shoes you know all the united shoes and on the we just went into the menu just to have a look because we fancied it It it's that one of the shoes is doing sunday night you can order and on it is obviously imitation we know that there's no absolutely 100 percent. we know that but it's got things like um, uh, Chris, um, what was it? Something bacon. It's obviously like a. <laughs> just yeah, as a okay. But it, is that that shouldn't be correct, should it? Okay. Bacon, they call it. Yeah. Sorry. They call it bacon, not bacon. Bacon. Ah. Right. Bake bacon. It is spelt bacon. Oh, okay. <laughs> on this menu that's going around the US shores. Is it not called it? like lamb bacon or something? Or what like, was it yeah. called? Um, it was called, I'm trying to think, but even to have like the name bacon on a kosher a KLBD thing, it's not, it just seems wrong. Oh, well, so let me have a look. You're talking about Crave? Yes. So let me have a look. Let me have a look. Yes. If you, what part was it on the? One second. Which part of a menu? It was on the loaded fries. Loaded fries, something with loaded fries. Okay, well, let me look at it now. Yeah, Crave. have a look through their menu. Um, yeah, it says crispy lamb bacon. Yeah, is that? I mean, I mean, look, you wouldn't have seen that in the 20th century, right? Just like you wouldn't have seen yeah kind of milkshakes, right? You know, and just like you wouldn't have seen. Well, this uh, is worse. I think this is far worse than yeah, parody. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, look. Uh, yeah. The, 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 I, I don't think you're the only one. No, I mean, look, it's it's not. It is fine it is kosher but yeah, yeah. I, I, you're not alone in, in thinking that is strange yeah it just i don't know it just seems not quite right something about it not not that i'm the frommest or strictest person but something about it's looking at yeah about three of their dishes it just seems not quite i don't know yeah no, I, don't, I don't disagree with you i don't disagree with you I mean, look, on the one hand people would say that on the other hand people would say look it's technically it's kosher there's nothing wrong yeah with it. yeah but it's it's just like excuse the pun but in bad taste almost <laughs> you know i hear that i hear that yeah okay thanks so much that was great really useful you know pleasure pleasure